Hey everyone, it's Friday and that means it's time for another episode of AI News, Drama, and Updates. So as you know, we're coming to the end of the month of May. Google just finished with its I.O., lots of big announcements in the AI space, and as a result, we're seeing a lot of people react. We're seeing a lot of changes take place. And one of the first and most immediate things I want to talk about is ChatGPT with the addition of the browsing and the plugins. So this is going to be for Plus users, and if you already have Plus, you just have to go into your settings, enable your beta features, and you'll have access now. Now this is actually a big change, super exciting, and the possibilities here are extreme. Browsing will allow GPT-4 to access the internet to get more relevant data or up-to-the-minute type stuff. And the plugins are each kind of different and unique, but they allow like pre-processing or post-processing of the context of what you're talking about. I'm not like a big fan of any one of them at the moment, and I'm not like a shill for any of them. But an example would be like Instacart, for example, where you could put in a lot of ingredients and I guess it'll tell you different recipes. Even in that type of setup, though, you can't go as far as creating an entire list and then just having it go to your account on the website. It's not that integrated yet, but potentially that's something that we could look forward to in the future. You know, GPT-4 was already the most powerful LLM we have access to, and this adds another layer to that. And the timing here makes perfect sense. Google had just released Bard to everyone. They upgraded the brain behind it, going from Palm to Palm 2. And some people, the people that have access to it, and we'll get to that in a minute, well, some people seem to be having a more pleasant experience with Bard. Though I'm not seeing a lot of universal acclaim. It's not everyone's cup of tea just yet. But we are seeing some shifting opinions. And in that vein, let's talk about Apple for a minute. Because Apple's not a company we've had a lot of big chances to talk about. They they never really seem to take a huge stance in the world of AI, aside from apparently banning it internally and not really allowing it within the company. But with the announcement just yesterday of iOS now allowing the ChatGPT app and GPT-4 is now accessible within your pocket if you have an iPhone, you know, this could definitely be symbolic of potential changes within the company's view of AI or how it perceives AI as a threat. Or it could simply be in response to the recent privacy changes that OpenAI instituted. But I think the takeaway here is we're starting to see Apple come into the fold a little bit. And that gets backed up by the fact that I'm seeing headlines now where they're actually looking for AI talent, which is, again, a big change for Apple in their policy and how they've approached AI up to this point. Now, in terms of the world, in terms of Google, let's talk about Google Bard. Uh, I mentioned that Google Bard wasn't accessible to everyone. Uh, it turns out if you're in the EU, you just don't have access to Google Bard just yet, even if you really, really want it. People in the EU, you're not really missing anything. Bard is not that amazing. If you have access to GPT 3.5, you're already seeing something that's probably a little bit more capable than what Bard is going to really offer. Now, that said, I don't believe that Bard is going to stay self-contained at a little subdomain of Google. I think that Bard is eventually going to replace the Google Assistant. I think that Bard is going to be integrated into generative search and all kinds of different things. And so what I think this really is, is the fact that the EU continues to try to regulate the heck out of AI, despite the fact that they're not really innovating in that space. And so this is possibly just Google getting all of their ducks in a row before it even approaches that market. But switching gears a little bit again, let's talk about China. So we've mentioned China multiple times in the past here. They've got their own versions of ChatGPT in the works. They've got their own versions of AI kind of all over the place. Now, here in the States, there's a couple of companies that have made it very clear that they are working towards AGI, artificial general intelligence. You got like Sam Altman of OpenAI. That is the goal is to create an artificial intelligence that can think for itself. Now, obviously, that's a loaded topic, and I'd love to hear your opinions in the comments below. But I say all that to say that Altman's stance on it may not be the universal stance. And so each country, of course, is going to have its own opinion. It looks like China is asking public opinion right now to see what the people of China think about the idea. This article goes on to say this isn't without precedent. Beijing did something similar when it came to like driverless taxis and, and really just cutting edge tech in general. I guess they're really wary about it. But week to week, we continue to hear more about China and how much of this AI stuff is really getting beyond that great firewall. And so to segue into a potentially dramatic type of situation, it looks like Midjourney China was released and then unreleased or announced and then kind of disappeared. This TechCrunch article talks about how it's a mystery right now. I guess we don't know exactly why the post was there and then gone, but it's also interesting to see what a user has to go through in the country of China to even access Midjourney. Seems like Discord is banned, so you'd have to get a VPN to get beyond that. The article talks about how China just kind of skipped over credit card technology, so it's not really all that common. And obviously in China, the government is more heavily involved in a lot of different stuff. So they may have been the reason that this post disappeared. And without more details, there's really not much more to go off of. So if I get any updates or changes to the story, I'll go ahead and update you here. Stability AI made a move that surprised me this week with open sourcing its Dream Studio application. So it looks like they've released something they're calling Stable Studio, which I don't know if it runs parallel to Dream Studio, if, 
if it's actually the same thing that's open source or an open source version of something similar. I'm not really exactly sure how it works, but it does look like Stability AI has released something in the open source world. But reading through this article, it seems like the reporter was having a difficult time trying to understand why this was happening as well. You know, this seems like a surprising move without a lot of immediate upside. Yeah, it is, and that's kind of why it's a little bit confusing. You know, Stability is not designed as a philanthropic company. It's not designed for the betterment of the human race. It's designed as a business. And we talked about this here. We talked about this before. Amadi used to be a hedge fund manager, and it very much is a company that is pretty much designed to kind of burn through cash without really being able to generate much money. So some people are guessing that this move is to try to get the open source community to do some of the development work for them. But from my perspective here, and after watching Stability and Runway's relationship kind of fall apart with the release of the 1.5 model, you know, watching a lot of the big announcements and changes and things that they've tried to do to the company since, at this point with the specific areas of the technology that they're working with, they're not exactly a tone setter anymore. You know, it feels like Stability AI used to be more of a pioneer in this industry, and now they don't have that seat at the table anymore. At this point, it's getting harder to say what they could really do to change that. But switching gears, let's talk about something a little bit more fun. Let's talk about a concept that I'm seeing a little bit more about. This headline is an example of one app. It looks like this one's called Clay, but I did see a few different apps like this come out. So what we're dealing with here looks like a newer concept. You give this thing access to your social media network. It spiders out, connects to everyone it can, tries to put all the data together. And what you end up with is something that you can ask questions to. It's got like perfect recall and it can answer questions about different relationships. Like, do I know anyone who knows how to make this particular recipe? Or, you know, who was it that was a photographer when I went to high school? Those types of things. So we're coming up into a future and you can take a look at this screenshot, you know, please provide a few gift ideas for Ellie's upcoming birthday. You know, whether you love this, hate this, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. It's definitely one of those topics that I think is going to be really divisive, but also kind of interesting to explore with a lot of people, especially people who have massive networks with thousands of friends. Like, how do you even keep up? And even if you hate this idea at first glance or hate the way that I've described it so far, take a look at the examples of some of the use cases here. And you can start to see where something like this might actually be handy. You know, I did think this one was interesting. If I'm going to London for a day, here's my friends who live in that area, you know. You know, and maybe this is weird and invasive, but it is becoming more normal and we're seeing more and more of this every week. In fact, there's a story you probably already did hear about. And I'm sure Wendy's is already getting a ton of heat for this. The idea that people are so easily replaceable with something like an AI chatbot scares the pants out of everyone. And I think with good reason. So it looks like a very specific Wendy's in June in a store in Columbus, Ohio. And as I tell you when and where this thing is going to happen, I'm realizing that this is probably immediately going to become like a TikTok trend to go mess with this thing. You know, messing with AI and getting it to do things that it's not supposed to do has become a very viral trend in the last like six, seven, eight months. But it seems like Wendy's chief executive, Todd, here is very confident that people will not be able to tell the difference. It's going to be very conversational, just like a regular drive through employee. And if we're going to dip our toes into the fear-mongering pool of jobs being stolen, let's talk about figure. Now, we did talk about figure before. It was just a few months ago, and it was very briefly. They're a company trying to design humanoid robots very similar to Boston Dynamics or maybe the Tesla robot, except for it exists. And this is what the figure robot looks like, like it was designed to be creepy. But what we have here is basically an update from figure showing that these are the robots that are going to be finally emerging into the real world. So they're calling these robots, by the way, the figure zero one, and they're going to be a behind the scenes type of robot. And this article goes into how companies are going to use them, how employees are going to react. And it also points at the aesthetics, which I think is an important thing to recognize. You know, for example, this is one by Agility Robotics. You know, Agility Robotics clearly went a different direction with their aesthetic uh, than something like Figure. But I suppose over time, we're going to see more competition emerge and we're going to see how the market actually reacts to something like this. You know, what do you think? Are you looking forward to having a robot maybe in your own home? Are you looking to have one as a coworker, maybe a personal assistant? You know, while I cover all this stuff and I talk a lot about it, I don't necessarily root for it in every regard. Now, I definitely don't know exactly what the future holds, but for me, and especially with topics like this, it's a really fun thing to think about. I won't spend a ton of time on this one, but I did want to mention it real quick because we did have Copilot, which is part of GitHub owned by Microsoft. We have a Amazon version of a code generator. We have Hugging Faces code generator. And now Meta has also put forth their own Copilot variant or their own AI-powered coding application. 
Now, I don't actually know for certain if they're going to release this entire thing as an open source project. I actually wouldn't be surprised, though. Meta has done that time and time again with all of their AI projects. It looks like this tool was built in a meta-based language called Hack, and it was fine-tuned on Meta's own code, but they didn't exactly talk about where the original code, the training material, and stuff like that originated from. So it very well may be the same stuff that landed GitHub's Copilot and other stuff into their various lawsuits from their copyright cases. But yeah, I mentioned last week that this was an area of AI that was heating up and heating up really, really fast. In addition, we also had the GPT-4 plugins that we talked about, and some of those plugins are able to refactor code and actually work with GPT-4 generated code directly within the browser. So not just the power of the tools, but how they work is also something that we're seeing a lot of innovations on. When it comes to AI, AI is powered by chips. And a lot of times we're using graphical processor units and we're using a ton of virtual memory. These NVIDIA cards in a way are being abused in a sense to get different results than what they were originally designed for. Now, months ago, we talked about companies that are in the process of making AI chips specifically as well, but it looks like Meta has also thrown its hat in the ring there. Now, you getting your hands on something like this, probably not going to happen anytime soon. These are going to be for commercial or enterprise type applications. So this is an MTIA, a Meta Training and in Inference Accelerator chip. And I'm really just showing you this as an example of a technology that I'm sure we're going to see innovations on and we're going to see a lot of expansion into. Because if we can get away from these gigantic GPU-based setups, that's going to save us a lot of energy, a lot of e-waste, and, and really just a lot of space. When you think about these companies and these supercomputers that run these gigantic AI-type applications, or even something like Stability AI, like what that company is, is basically a room full of GPUs, A100s. You know, this article mentions Meta, for example, has 2,000 of those A100 systems, and and again, these are video graphics cards. These are designed for video games or complex graphical operations. So as we move forward, we're just now seeing hardware start to catch up with where the software has been going for almost a year now. And as we talk about where we're going, of course, this was one of the biggest stories of the week. As Sam Altman, the owner of OpenAI, along with others, he got brought up before Congress, and not only did he talk about the dangers of AI, he gave his thoughts on regulation within the industry and a lot of other things. There were a lot of headlines like this, and I don't want to talk badly about any of the news articles. I, I understand the sensationalism behind it. But what I want to focus on here is one of the biggest points that Sam made in his speech. It was a four hour long speech, but I think one of the biggest points that a lot of people are going to miss is that he feels that companies like his, like Google, the big companies should be regulated because that's dangerous. But smaller companies like startups, they shouldn't have to follow those same regulations because those would be crippling and would prevent them from getting off the ground. He clarified on Twitter and basically said it was like power regulation. If you're running a solar operation, you don't need complex regulation. But if you're running like a nuclear power plant, of course you need heavy regulation. It's dangerous. And so if something like GPT-4 is dangerous enough that they have to restrict access to certain pieces of information, things along those lines, it would be inappropriate and dangerous to leave it in the hands of capital. He also addressed, as we have here, the pause in AI development, the, uh, the open letter that we've talked about. And I feel like he made his thoughts on the matter pretty clear. He said, yeah, we need to regulate this industry. We need to do it now. The call for a six-month pause would be just an arbitrary amount of time. It wouldn't mean anything specifically. And there's no guarantee it would help. As we talk about the world of entertainment, video games, movies, things like that in general, I want to mention Ubisoft, which is not everyone's favorite publisher, but certainly a well-known one. Uh, they decided to take a stance, a public statement about AI and their inclusion into future AI and video games. Now, like we talked about last week, gamers reacted pretty crazy to the release of even a screenshot with mid-journey being utilized in the game of System Shock. But I didn't see a lot of crazy fallout when it came to Blizzard announcing a patent for AI technology that they were working on. So it's hard to say exactly how gamers are going to react, I think, until they get a sense of how it's being used or where it's going to be used. As we get closer to the end of today's video, I want to just point out that we're talking again about artists losing jobs. We're talking about developers potentially losing jobs. We talked about Wendy's employees potentially losing jobs. But this, again, is not AI. This is capitalism. And so I wanted to show you that we do have a defense against AI job loss. And this is exactly what we should be doing as organization. When it comes to AI and specifically job loss as a result of AI, the conversation shouldn't be about regulation of AI. The conversation should be about workers' rights. It would seem like the regulations that should be put in place should be to protect the people. 
But these companies, they can't run without customers and they can't run without employees. And the people at the top with a few AI powered machines certainly can't do everything. And so very much like the Writers Guild and now like CNET, so collective action, collective bargaining, things like that, these are gonna be the tools that are actually gonna be useful in the AI war that's really coming. You know, not only is this the far more realistic threat than something like a Terminator or a Cylon, but this is actually happening right now, and you can see how we're already fighting against it. So I'll leave you on that note today. I appreciate those of you who made it to the end of the video. As always, your likes, your comments, interactions of any type always help this channel out, and I really appreciate all of that. If you have any questions about anything we covered this week or you want clarification on anything, please feel free to leave a comment below or join me in the Discord. But until next time, thanks for watching.